Welcome to the KPC Podcast. This week's message is from Dr. Benjamin Williams. Before I get started, I want to get, and <laughs> which is to say, before I get started, I want to get started. <clears throat> but before I get started on the sermon, the first sermons I've preached here have been pretty much kind of standard things that I preach in just about every church I go into. Because everybody, you know, every church in transition is going to be dealing with it's all right, thank you, stuff like, oh, loss, grief, some anger. There's going to be some anxiety. There just is. Some more than others. And some may be off the charts. <laughs> Not that I'm saying anything with that. But when the Lord told, sent me here, he, he told me he was going to start a healing ministry here. What you didn't know is it's starting with everybody who's in this room right now. <laughs> starting with healing broken hearts. Well, I just assumed that would be it. Well, we're also having to work to fix broken finances some broken, maybe some broken committees, certainly a broken membership role, and all kinds of administrative stuff that I never really wanted to admit was sort of charismatic, you know? Charismatics don't really worry about those kinds of things. Well, maybe that's been part of our problem. And that we need to learn how to be normal plus. We've been trying so hard to be plus, we've forgotten how to be normal as a church. So we're going to learn how to be normal plus. But there's also, he's been weighing on me a lot, and it's just been, it's been a real burden to me. And people ask what I listen to when I'm driving, when I do get to drive back and forth home, which is about four and a half hours each way, and I get home about every other week. I don't listen to much of anything because I'm praying most of that time and I'm praying for this church because there are hurts that go so deep. And I think you've been hearing a little of that. The wonderful thing is we have a God who knows those deep hurts and wants to heal those deep hurts. Amen. And there are some things we have to deal with and talk about and open up. That's part of what we're going to be doing in our in our town hall meeting starting tonight, which by the way, I'm serving a, a I keep getting asked, so I know what you really want to know is what am I serving? <laughs> I'm serving, it's called Shadiner uh, Sekali um, Gulyash. I'm sure that makes it all, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Had some last week, it was. Uh, this is a recipe that I picked up in Transylvania. <laughs> I'll let you think, you know, imagine what, what's in it, right? Uh, this is a recipe from the, uh, probably sometime from the 1300s. Um, and it's, it's a, a goulash. It's a, that was a German colony originally, by the way, Transylvania. So it's a German take on a, on a Hungarian goulash. And it's really delicious. And I'm fixing it first because my wife makes me do this. This is one of Cece's absolute favorite things that I cook. And so she's hoping that instead of, you know, I'm, I'm, fix, I'm preparing for maybe upwards of 200 people, she's hoping there'll only be 199 there. <laughs> so that she can get the leftovers in a little baggie that I will freeze and dutifully bring home to her. So take that as a commendation of the meal tonight. So, But these are going to be a really important series of meetings where we deal with, uh, starting with, we deal with the stuff that's still stuck in our craw, and the good things in the past that we have sort of ignored or forgotten about because we've been so focused on bad things or negative things or pain or whatever. 
But for the next few weeks, I want to deal with some of the issues that I know are out there and help us find a way, shall we say, out of the darkness into the light. Because we're going to start seeing healing happen as we get out of the darkness to get into God's light. So today my, my sermon is, Who's Writing Your Story? Who's Writing Your Story? During a youth evangelization many, many years ago, many, many years ago, several young people gave their testimonies, and near the end of the service, Emily went to the microphone to tell how she had been abandoned as an infant, cared for in a group home, then a foster home until she was adopted. And she told about how her unmarried mother, whom she never knew, did not love her and did not want her. She tearily described the pain of growing up wondering what it was about her that made her mother reject her and how lonely and isolated she had felt her whole life. And as weeping teens hurried forward to comfort her and pray for her, I kept wondering when this would turn into a testimony you know, a witness to the life-changing power of Jesus' love. It never did. Another day, some years later, a young man, I, I don't remember his name exactly, I, I think it was Edward, I'll call him Edward. He told how his unmarried mother had surrendered him up for adoption because she wanted something better for him than she could ever provide. And he was fostered and he was adopted by a loving family. Now, unlike biological families, you know, where you get what you get, he explained he was chosen. He was chosen, they wanted him, and his adoptive, adoptive parents were proud of him and believed in him. And looking back, he said he was grateful to God. It was a gift. It was grateful to God that his birth mother had loved him enough and had received the wisdom to do the right thing so that he could have a, a good home and have more opportunities. Two young people from almost identical circumstances, both given up for adoption by young and desperate unwed mothers, both began in the system, but eventually found homes with caring families, but there the similarities end. The one can only dwell on her losses, her wounded emotions, her feelings of guilt and inadequacy and loneliness, and the other one, the other one treasures the blessings he received, that he was freely chosen to be taken in and loved. The one looks to, to God's wisdom and the other only human trauma. Two similar circumstances, but two radically different narratives. And those opposing narratives will steer each one toward radically opposite destinies. Do you hear me? The narrative you believe will determine where you're heading. The stories of our lives. I don't know about you, I grew up in a family full of stories. Stories how, oh, I don't know, 
My great, great, great grandfather walked 20 something miles to Suffolk in order to go to a Methodist camp meeting and just, he kept, just kept, got there and kept walking right up the aisle and gave his life to Jesus. Became a Methodist preacher or a, a lay preacher. And then, by the way, having done that, he turned around and walked home. Stories how my great-grandfather spent his entire fortune helping the poor in his county through the Great Depression. Stories how my paternal grandfather served as a frontline chaplain, volunteered as a frontline chaplain in World War I. How he commandeered once a logging train to evacuate his Minnesota town just minutes before it was completely consumed by a raging wildfire. Stories. Stories. Stories how I was delivered, how I was born, during a driving snowstorm, five weeks premature, in the doorway to the emergency room, in the hall, by an off-duty nurse in a Kelly green coat. <laughs> and my mother was so disappointed because I was so small, she simply sniffed, not even as big as a good rolled roast. <laughs> That's why I had to grow so tall, <laughs> to prove her wrong. We heard our stories from time to time, the same stories, and often they were retold in the, in the same words, the narratives of our family. And then there are the stories I wrote myself. You know, the ones I wrote in the process of living, in the telling and the retelling, I'd find the words that captured the essence of what, it ex what I'd experienced and what it was I wanted to say, how I could say it best, how I wanted to frame it. And my stories became pretty well fixed as well, maybe stereotyped. If I tell you the same story twice, you'll know because I'll probably tell it the exact same way both times. That's how I cemented it in my mind so I don't forget it. And these stories, they remind me who I am, how I got here. They inform the decisions I make. It's the narrative of my life. Well, maybe you didn't grow up hearing the same family stories over and over again. You might not even know any family stories. But... You have the stories you wrote, you know, in your living. The personal narratives about your childhood, your growing up, uh, your coming of age, your courtship, your first job, whatever. Hopefully how you came to Jesus or how you were filled with the Spirit. How God answered that prayer once. And like our two adoptees, Emily and Edward, your personal narrative not only explains and expresses something of who you are and how you got there, but it's going to continue to shape what you think of yourself and who you are becoming. So, be careful how you frame your story. Do you hear me? Be careful how you frame your story and guard your story don't let someone else write it for you do you hear me don't let someone else write it for you your story will set the tone for the rest of your life so what is your story and who's been writing it Individuals have stories, families have stories, nations have stories, churches have stories. The church, meaning the people of God, Jew and Gentile, throughout history, 
We talk about Old Testament or Old Covenant and New Covenant, but God is the same, and ultimately his covenant is one. The covenant of forgiveness of grace. So all of us in this covenant of grace held in the palm of God's hand through the ages, we have our stories too. The church has its stories. And these are part of our stories. And the story a church remembers will help to shape who it is and who it's going to be. Every year, it's good to see Ed here. By the way, I didn't get to say something, but. Good to see Ed. So every year, when an Israelite would bring his first fruits offering, which was a gift of thanksgiving for the land of promise that God had provided, he would come and he was to recite to the priest the, this narrative of his life, his sacred story, kind of call it his family story, if you think in terms of really his church family. So if you're following me, you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 26. We'll start at verse 4. Or you can follow it on the screen, or I'll just read it to you. Deuteronomy 26. When the priest takes the basket from your hand, you're bringing your offering, so you, know, you hand it to him, and he takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. And the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given me. You can stop there. Even skeptical Bible scholars recognize that this is an ancient, well, what they might call an ancient creed. It was known, it was remembered by heart, verbatim, the exact same words, going back to the earliest days of Israel's history. In Hebrew, it's structured and rhythmic. It's almost like poetry so it will be memorable and be remembered for all generations to come. This is the narrative of faith. Who God is and what he did and who I am, where I came from and why I am here. Now every Israelite was expected to teach his children the same sacred story, in fact, verbatim. But let, let me read you a few more verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which we don't have on the screen. You'll have to actually listen to me. Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 20. When your children ask you in time to come, then you shall say to your children, We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. 
the Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh and all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. Did you hear that? We find the same themes and often, especially in Hebrew, the exact same phrases that the Israelite would, the same phrases the Israelite would confess to the priest. It's part of a fixed family story to be memorized and passed on. This is who we are. And child, this is who you are too. Throughout the books of the Torah, the Old Testament law, you will find the same phrases echoed again and again. The Hebrews are brought out of the house of slavery, or you may know it as, as I grew up with it, out of the house of bondage. They're brought out of the house of bondage in Exodus chapter 13, verse 3 and 14, Deuteronomy, you don't need to look all this up, I'll just, just so you get an idea of how often, Deuteronomy 5, 6, 6, 12, 8, 14, 13, 5, it is even cemented in the Ten Commandments where we read, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's how it starts, Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments. The people are delivered by God's mighty hand and an outstretched arm. In Exodus 6.6, 6, Deuteronomy 4.34, 5.15, 7.19, 9.29, 2. You don't have to look all those up. You can find them all in any, any good concordance. I just want you to see that these that this story and these the phrases that shape in that are that are shaped this story were preserved and memorized passed down in set patterns and they keep being referred to and quoted and cited all the way through and the patterns that lay out the purpose the promise and the power of God this is who we are and how we got there. And every time that they're doing another cultic action or they're having another prayer or they're facing another crisis, you hear these same words, the same narrative being cited as they find strength and direction from their story. However, that's not the only version of the story we find in the Bible. Woven through the narratives, especially in Exodus and in, Le in Numbers, we find other people who are trying to write a different story, a different narrative. I'm going to read a few of these to you. In Exodus 14, was it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? For it would have been better to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Exodus chapter 17, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Numbers 20, why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness for us and our livestock to die here? Numbers 14, is it too little that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Now I want you to notice that's referring to Egypt. You brought us up out of there to kill us in the wilderness? It's clear you've not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey or given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. Numbers 20. 
Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to bring us to this wretched place? It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Numbers 11, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. And now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. And that's not even all of the relevant passages. I hope that's enough so you get the idea. These are so what they call the murmurings or the grumblings of the malcontents in the wilderness. Against Moses and ultimately against God. In the first story, or just like that first story of deliverance, these are also fairly regular in style and structure. And they also often repeat catchphrases uh, from one to another. And they're all, all of them are snide rhetorical questions. They're challenges that paint the old life of slavery in Egypt in glowing terms... No, and they even call Egypt a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses forced them to leave against their will, cruelly, on purpose, in order to let them and their children languish and perish in the desert wilderness. None of his promises have come true. No milk, no honey, no fruits or vegetables, no vineyards, no grain fields. It would be better to return to Egypt, and if they can't do, it would be better just to go ahead and die. You see, what we find from Exodus through Deuteronomy is a war of stories. Do you hear me? It is a war of stories. Two opposing narratives compete for the heart and the will of the people. The one is spread by fearful and angry malcontents, and it preys on the church's anxiety for the future, its dissatisfaction and anger under the present circumstances and its leaders. It paints an idealized past in golden terms, and it disparages where the church has been and where it's heading. The other casts a vision of the liberating hand of God leading his people out into freedom by mighty signs and wonders. Despite trials and setbacks and the promise of eventual fulfillment when God will keep his word to the patriarchs and bring them into a fertile land of promise. Two stories, completely opposite. And the destiny of the church of God there in the wilderness, the destiny of the church will depend in significant measure on which story gains the hearts and the minds of the church, which story people will choose to believe. Who is writing the story, and how does it impact who I am and what I'll choose to do as a result? Back then, the people of God could not really move forward until they let go of the hateful, negative narrative of cruel Moses and embrace the faith-filled, confident narrative of God's unfolding salvation. They did at last move forward. But as we all know, it meant, however, that an entire generation chose to believe the bad report. 
An entire generation chose the wrong story, and the people of God could not move forward until that generation, well, what happened to them? They wanted to die in the wilderness? Well, then, that's what you want. That's what God will give you. And they all did. They chose to believe the negative narrative of the malcontents. And so they, they got what they wanted. And the church could not move forward into promise until that was gone and had been let go of one way or another. What's true for the Old Testament church is no less true for the New Testament church, and it's nowhere more true than for here in KPC. This church has had an absolutely incredible impact on its community. And I'm looking forward to hearing and celebrating some of the glorious stories how lives have been touched and transformed by God through you and through this congregation. I know these stories are there and I want to hear them. You have also seen some spectacular failures. <laughs> spectacular failures. And I've been listening to many of you talk about those days, especially that failed City of Hope project. I don't mind hearing about ups and Every church is going to have ups and downs, and sometimes they'll have spectacular ups and downs. It's okay. What has been troubling me as I've been hearing stories is this. Different people have been telling me the same narrative. The same narrative. It's a suspicious and angry story. Often it's told me by different people in different settings in the exact same words. Do you understand that? Exact same words. This has been practiced. This has been drilled. This has been repeated over and over until it is fixed in our minds, in our hearts, in our mouths. How somebody had to have known something that they hid from the congregation. How somebody had to have made a lot of money off their deception. How the session was keeping secrets from the church. How the evil presbytery came in and kicked out the good people who were trying to find the truth. Have you heard that story too? Talk to me. You've heard that story. You've heard that story. Have you maybe, you don't have to answer this one, have you maybe not just heard it, have you maybe believed it and repeated it yourself? Beware of who's writing your story. We're going to look at the City of Hope, what really happened and why. We're going to take a look at how some in the church reacted over the next few weeks. I have access to all the minutes and all the records and all the information. All. <laughs> and I know enough about human nature where there are any gaps, I know exactly what happened because I know how people do peoplish things. And I'll be glad to share, some, share that with you. Everything that's important. That whole episode still sticks in this church's crawl, as we say in the Deep South. 
Do y'all have a craw up here in Virginia? <laughs> well, it's sticking in people's craws. It just, and they can't move forward until you find some resolution. And it's been 10 years and there's still no resolution. It's time to get that. Time to resolve it. For the moment, though, let me point out that the narrative which I have heard again and again is the story as it was framed and told by a circle of malcontents. It's a story born out of suspicion and anger and bitterness, and it is a story concocted to justify any and all vindictiveness. And it is a story that leaves God completely out of the picture. Tell me, is there something wrong with that? When we let that become the story of our church, when we leave God out of the story, you know, that's what we find in the wilderness. They don't say God brought us out of Egypt to kill us in the wilderness. They say, who brought us out? Moses. It's those leaders of the church. They brought us out to kill us. They're trying to destroy us. Moses brought us out into the wilderness to kill us with hunger or thirst. It was Pastor Nate or the session or somebody who brought us into this horrible situation in order to profiteer off the destruction of the church. It's not true, of course. It doesn't even make sense. It may not be true, but I want you to listen to this. I'm even going to repeat this so you'll get it. The long, slow membership decline that has plagued and alarmed this congregation over the last eight years is ultimately one self-destructive consequence of believing and repeating the wrong narrative. Yeah. We do it to ourselves. And let me say that again, in case you forgot what the first part of the sentence was by the time I got to the last part. The long, slow membership decline that has troubled and alarmed this congregation over the last eight years is ultimately one self-destructive consequence of believing and repeating the wrong narrative. It's what happens. I see this kind of thing in one form or another over and over. What's true for Israel, true for this church, is true for you and me individually as well. You have a story, you have a narrative. So who is writing, what is your story and who is writing your story? We live in a culture that loves spin, you know. We love to rewrite people's stories in ways that, that crush and destroy. Just look at what the press does. Look at what the internet commentators do. How they'll take the most innocuous thing out of somebody's life, some stupid thing they did 24 years ago, bring it up as if it was current now, and then blackball them because of the spin that's been put on something from way before. That's just the way the world and our culture now does it. That's what our culture loves to do. And that, so it's no surprise that every few months we hear about a child or another young teen who has 
committed suicide because of cyberbullying. You know what I'm saying? They chose to believe the cruel things that others wrote to them and wrote about them. They let somebody else write their story until their only recourse, they think, their only way out is to write themselves out of their own story. Watch out who's writing your story. In her hit song, You Say, Lauren Daigle struggled with what story she will listen to. You know the story, you know the words. But I want, instead of, I'm not going to sing it right now, I want you to listen to just the words. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I'm weak. You say I am held when I'm falling short. And when I don't belong, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe what you say of me. You see, the one story is born out of fear, suspicion, anger, self-hatred. And it tells you you're unloved and unlovable. You're inadequate and defective. You're worthless. And it leaves God out of the equation. It's as if Emily were to write your story. Poor Emily. But there's another story about who you are, the one that God can see from a higher perspective. And God has a very different narrative about you, and by the way, about this church. God says that you are chosen, like Edward, intentionally, lovingly adopted into his own family. God says he is your father. And you are his beloved child. God says your failures, your wrongs have been paid for and erased by what Jesus did for you on the cross. And God says that while you may be humanly weak, he is your strength. He makes you capable of facing any challenge in his name. God says there is no pain or suffering in your life that cannot be redeemed healed, transformed into something good. God says you are not alone, never alone, but surrounded by his compassionate arms and a host of angels and sisters and brothers in the faith who care about you and pray for you. So hear the good news of the gospel. You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God. The course of your life, your future, and your destiny depend on which version of your story you choose to believe. As the prayer ministers come forward, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Lord, the problem with our stories is that we hear them and tell them so often we take them for granted. 
So, Lord, open our eyes, open our ears to hear the words out of our own mouth as if we hadn't heard them before. And give us hearts to weigh them and to see where you are in that story. And if you're not in that story, Lord, we don't want to be in that story either. You have a better story for us. You have a better perspective on the events of our lives. You have a better perspective on the events of our church. You even have a better perspective on the events in our our nation. So, Lord, you give us the narrative. Help us find ways, memorable ways, but true and honest ways to tell our story in ways that bring honor to you and health to us. In Jesus' name, we ask it. All God's people say, Amen. Thank you for listening to the KPC podcast. For more messages and information, visit kpc.org.